report that the river was going to flood the town and that all the residents should evacuate their homes. But the man said, I'm religious. I pray God loves me and God will save me. The waters rose up and a man in a rowboat came along and he shouted, hey you, hey you in there. The town is flooding, let me take you to safety. But the man shouted back to him, no, I'm religious, I pray. God loves me, God will save me. Next, a helicopter came hovering overhead, and a person with a megaphone shouted, hey, you down there, the town is flooding. Let me drop this ladder and I'll take you to safety. But the man shouted back up at the helicopter, I'm religious, I pray, God loves me, and God will save me. The man drowned. And standing at the gates of St. Peter, he demanded an audience with God. Lord, he said, I'm a religious man. I pray, I thought you loved me. Why did this happen? And God said, I sent you a radio report, a helicopter, and a guy in a rowboat. You're not supposed to be here yet. Do you ever feel like you might have missed an important sign from God somewhere along? I, I know that I do. Looking back, we see where we missed something important sometimes on our journey. And that can be really discouraging. What's worse is, often we miss something important and there's no way we can ever go back and do it over again. We discover that we have to live with the results of our choices and that can be a hard pill to swallow. I know for me in my own life, it seems that my life has been a series of misses and modifications, if I'm honest. And yet, somewhere in all of that, I can still see God at work. Today's gospel passage is dealing with these very things, missed signs and the modifications that we make. The passage is from Matthew, and it says this, the Pharisees and Sadducees came to Jesus and tested him by asking him to show them a sign from heaven. He replied, when evening comes, you say, it will be fair weather for the sky is red. And in the morning today, it will be stormy for the sky is red and overcast. You know how to interpret the appearance of the sky, but you cannot interpret the signs of the times. A wicked and adulterous generation looks for a sign, but none will be given it except the sign of Jonah. Jesus then left them and went away. When I read through the Gospels, I'm continually amazed at how much this group of characters, called the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the religious elite of the day, how much of a thorn in the side they were to Jesus. These were deeply religious people, deeply devoted people. The problem was they were so devoted to their rules and their rituals that they often overlooked the obvious. And much of Jesus' time was spent having to respond to them, challenging, challenging his teachings. And that's what's happening again here in this verse. Jesus is trying to get them to realize that the way of God is often not complex or hard to see. More often than not, it's obvious. They're asking him for a sign, a miraculous sign, and they're getting a sign, but they're not seeing it. Jesus even tries to explain it by using one of their well-known stories from the Talmud. The story of Jonah, this is a story they would have told one another every year during Yom Kippur. But they still don't see it. Is everybody here familiar with the story of Jonah? Because if not, it's important that we understand that. The story of Jonah has a central character in it by the name of Jonah. Big news flash, right? It's named after him. But Jonah is a story where God commands him to go into a city called Nineveh and prophesy against the city because of its wickedness. But instead, Jonah runs away and gets on a boat. And while he is on this boat, this huge storm hits and 
the sailors realizing this is no ordinary storm, they, they start doing something called casting lots, almost like uh, rolling dice or something, to see who on the boat is to blame. And they figure out that it's Jonah, so they throw him overboard. And when they do, the storm calms down. So Jonah is in the water. He gets swallowed by a big fish, maybe a whale. I don't know what kind of fish it was. But he spends three days and three nights in the stomach of this fish. And while he is inside of this fish, Jonah asks for forgiveness for running away from Nineveh and running away from God. And then God commands the fish to vomit Jonah out onto the shore. I can, on, I can only imagine what he was covered in when he came out of that fish. Jonah goes back to Nineveh. He gives the prophecy to its inhabitants, and the people hear him, and the city is humbled and brokenhearted, and God sees the hearts of the people and saves the city from destruction. That's the story of Jonah in a nutshell, or in a fish stomach. <laughs> Jesus says to the religious experts of the day, you got to understand the story of Jonah to understand what I'm trying to say to you here. He says, a wicked and adulterous generation looks for a sign, but none will be given it except the sign of Jonah. Then Jesus left them and went away. In other words, Jesus is saying to them, you already have all of the information that you need. You're just not seeing it. What is that information? Well, if you study scripture, there are a lot of parallels between the story of Jonah and the life of Jesus. Jesus is also rejected. Jesus is crucified after they cast lots for his robe, for his clothing. He spends three days and three nights in the grave after being crucified and then he comes back. Jonah's rejected and thrown overboard. They cast lots about him, and he spends three days and three nights in the belly of a fish underwater, and then he comes back. And what Jesus is trying to do by referencing the story of Jonah here is to personalize this. He's trying to say something like, you want me to perform a miracle you want me to perform a sign or a wonder. But that's not the point because I'm not here to convince you with magic. I'm right here standing in front of you. I'm the sign that you're looking for. That's the point. And you're so concerned with magic that you can't see that I'm standing right here. That's what he's saying to these religious leaders. In um, Buddhism, in the tradition and religion of Buddhism, it's said that Siddhartha Gautama, the founder of Buddhism, the guy that we call the Buddha today, was known to display these strange phenomena in his life when he was deep in meditation. Something called cities, not like city, but S-I-D-B-H-I. And when he was deep in meditation, it said that sometimes he would start floating. Or if he was walking and meditating, he would just walk out on top of a lake and he wouldn't sink into the water. And when he was asked about these strange, miraculous things by his followers, they wanted to know how they could reproduce these things in their own lives. And he would often respond like this. These things happen on their own as one progresses on the path of enlightenment. But do not seek them. They will distract you from walking the path if you do. And I think that's kind of in the realm of what Jesus is trying to get across to these deeply devoted, deeply religious people in this passage. Don't seek signs. Don't seek miracles. Look at what's right in front of you, namely, people. Stop trying to be superhuman, just be human. That is the point of all this. See people, immerse yourselves in the lives of people. 
That's reality, not fantasy. One of my uh, favorite television shows is a show called True Detective on HBO. Anybody ever watch that? Some of the seasons are good, some are better. My favorite is the first season. And um, one of the protagonists in the first season is doing an interview with some other detectives, and he's lamenting some of the choices that he's made in his life and in his marriage. And I think he sums up this way of being beautifully human when he says to the detectives, he says, do you know the good years when you're in them? Or do you just wait for them until you get cancer and realize that the good years came and went? Because there's a feeling that you might notice it sometime. This feeling that life has somehow slipped through your fingers. Like the future is behind you. Like it's always been behind you. You know, I cleaned up, but maybe I didn't change. Not the way I needed to. Remember what I said about the detective's curse? The solution to my whole life was right under my nose. That woman, those kids, but I was watching everything else. See, infidelity is one kind of sin, but my true failure was inattention. And I understand that now. The reality is, if you are a person trying to live the spiritual life, that you are surrounded by signs and wonders and miracles in your life every moment of every day. Those miracles have two arms, two legs, two ears, two eyes, and a nose, and a mouth. They're bipedal. <laughs> They're inhabitants of the planet Earth. They look like your friends. Sometimes they look like your enemies. They are in your life not to be overlooked or looked past for something more miraculous. They are the miraculous. In fact, there is nothing more miraculous. People. That's where God is inside of everyday people. It's why Paul would ask a question of the church in Corinth when he says, Do you not realize that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? The Spirit of God has made its home in you. That's not a passage that's trying to get you to exercise or to quit eating bacon. That passage is trying to get you to realize that God is in every person that you come in contact with and in the person that you see when you look in the mirror. If you're looking for God and you can't seem to find God in your life, one thing is for sure. You'll never get closer to God by getting further away from people. The man drowned. And standing at the gates of St. Peter, he demanded an audience with God. Lord, he said, I'm a religious man. I pray. I thought you loved me. Why did this happen? And God said, I sent you a radio report. I sent you a helicopter. And I sent you a guy in a rowboat. You're not supposed to be here yet. You might be looking for a sign in your life. And it might be for something really important. But the answer that God is sending you is found in people. People who are wired the way that I am are the reason that monasteries were invented. Um, I am not a people person. I'm just not. I'm 
the guy that's not good at parties. It's de-energizing for me to be in a room full of people and shaking hands and asking like 30 people in a row, how are you doing? And you, you're not really asking them how they're doing, it's just how you start the conversation. I know people that are very energized by that, I'm not one of them. And so I do my very best to protect my alone time. And sometimes that's not good. I was um, on my way to work the other day. It happened to be one of the days this winter where one could actually go outside without freezing to death. And I was walking to work, and I rounded the corner here. And while I was rounding the corner here on this side of the street, Pastor Chuck from across the way rounded the corner on the other side of the street. Now, if you know Chuck, He's one of those guys that's energized by being in parties and having small talk and asking lots of questions. And I'll be honest with you, and I would say this to him if he were in this room this morning, but when Chuck rounded that corner, I thought to myself, oh, God. <laughs> like, I, I just don't have it this morning. It, it's morning. I, I just don't want to see another human being. And so I thought, well, maybe if I just walk quietly and slowly, he won't see me. But he saw me. And he got, you know, like, engaged me, and we started talking. And while we were talking, I had, um, I had, had a particularly difficult week that week. And as I was more so listening to Chuck talk than me doing the talking. But as he was talking, I started thinking about his life and about his story, which is similar to my own. And it helped me to just be there with someone that was older and more experienced than I was. And to just see that they survived it. That they made it through it, and it wasn't perfect, and it, it wasn't always beautiful or precise. But they made it to the other side of that challenge. And they continued on in a life that God still had for them. And I needed to hear that, that particular morning, even though it's not what I wanted I didn't want to have a conversation with a human being. I would have preferred to be all alone by myself, go into my office, shut the door, read the books, pray the prayers, repeat the lines, look for an inspiring quote on Brady quote or something like that. But that's not how God does it. God is just as much alive in that person that you don't want to see. And God might actually have a message for you. Something that you need to hear that you will not hear unless it comes through the vessel of another human being. And wherever you are in your life this week, if you're like me, and you think of people as something that sometimes, a, a, a thing that you have to endure in conversation or in small talk. Or if you're one of those people that just loves being around people. Try to shift your perspective when you're in a conversation and ask yourself, is God trying to show me something here in this? Am I just thinking this is regular, this is every day, this isn't anything miraculous, when it actually is? When Mother Teresa was on the streets of Calcutta ministering to the sick and the dying, she said that when she would see people that were literally rotting on the street, just days, hours away from death. When she was asked about why she was doing that, when she could really make no difference, 
She said, I get up every morning and I go and I walk these streets and I minister to Christ in all of his distressing disguises. That's what each of us are. The Spirit of God lives in us. Some of our disguises are more distressing than others. Mine has no air. <laughs> but God is alive in you. And as you go out into your life this week, maybe you can start living your life thinking, God is in me. God is in that person and that person. And maybe that's what miracles are that are always there. 